We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Maya. I'm Remy. I'm Gerald. And I'm Anais. And on today's episode, we're going to be discussing Drone by Hari Kuzru. Kunzru. I'm going to re-say that so you can cut it in so I don't totally butcher it. Okay. <laughs> and on today's episode, we are going to be discussing Drone by Hari Kunzru. And this story is really an excerpt of a novel that has been edited down to a short story. And it tells the tale of post-apocalyptic world, our world, where there is you know, rampant uh, poverty combined with huge amounts of rich um, resource stealing folks. <laughs> I'm going to start over. I hate the summary. I hate the summary. The story is going to be hard to summarize. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's not, it, there's just so much going on. Okay. Um, and this story, we start off with seeing the rich, the Seth. He owns most of the, most of the food production, synthetic food production, about 25% of the world's synthetic food production. He has a huge mansion on the top of a hill that he rebuilds every few years, and he is 150 years old. He has physical augmentations, and his young daughter has been created in order to promote perfection throughout his paternal line. And this is contrasted with the poor miners who mine necessary metals needed in order to keep this new economy going. This really is a post-apocalyptic sort of post-destruction kind of world where there's lots of poverty, um, resources have been drained, and there's it's not the world that we know it. But at the same time, there are parts of this world that feel very similar. There's a young man named Jai who is not augmented, and everyone looks at him as if he is special because he's quite beautiful. And he goes to an augmenter in order to get a new arm, in order to make it easier for him to do his mining work. In the process, he gets a virus, which mm-hmm. to, which rages through his body until he is near death. And at the end of the story, we see him looking at the sky, waiting for death to come. Okay, so top level, how'd you guys like this story? I I started off by not liking it. And then I did like it a lot. Oh, that surprised me. There you go. Rami? Um, I... I will wait till to hear what everyone else says because I don't even think this should have been included as a short story. <laughs> Remy, you are so harsh. You are so like no, limited. Well, it is an excerpt is another, from a novel, but exactly, it has been edited this is down to a short thing story. Gerald has said, has said before in private conversations, like we pushed the boundaries, but I think at some point there should be limits. <laughs> No. I thought that he was going to like this. It has morals. It tells you something about the world. It's telling you that we have to improve or else this is what's going to happen to us. I thought Rami was going to be all in on this. Okay, Annie, so what did you think about this story? So I loved it. This is perfectly in the Annie's wheelhouse of dystopian sci-fi. Like this is this is it's my fun. bag. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> loved it. <laughs> okay, Remy, let, let's hear why we're all wrong. From the start, what, what about let's hear why you like it? You usually start no, with- we're still waiting for your top level. We're still waiting for your top level. Do you like it or do you not like it? This is how we start every single show. You cannot get away from this. Clearly, he doesn't like it. No, I, I liked the story. I just don't think that this excerpt worked because oh. I think – when when I, and I know the reason why people do it, maybe it's for authors to generate buzz and, and all that stuff before the actual novel comes out. But I think it works a lot better for nonfiction than fiction generally. I mean, it's, at times it, it can work, but I think, so if we're to consider this a short story, then maybe if I took a novel and picked out seven pages for us to read, can I use that as a submission for next week? No, there's a lot of stuff missing here. And I, I, I was just thrown off. And we said this too, there's a lot of stuff going on. Like, and it, it, everything made sense to me at the last line when it said drone is an extract from a forthcoming novel. I'm like, all right, so the, 
this thing is incomplete, basically. And it, that that's definitely something we're going to have to talk about in this episode. For me, it worked. Um, and like you said, it is hard to do excerpts of novels and make them into short stories. Um, I think a lot of times when it's done the best is a lot of novels start out as short stories. And you may never see the short story, but in the author's head and maybe in their summary, it really is a short story. And then they expound upon it. They add extra threads and it creates a novel. Um, and so reading this... Your cake and eat it too. Or you can't have the, the, the best of both worlds. Like if you're well, going, I think sometimes you, you can. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, you know, some authors do it well and some don't. And so that's something that we're definitely going to have to talk about in this because it was written in a way that is not a typical short story that we have read on this podcast. So let's start out talking about the structure of this story. It's told in two parts. It is all prose. There is not one line of dialogue in the entire story that I can think of. Did you guys see a line? I don't, I don't think there was one line of dialogue and it was very much all tell no showing, which is traditionally frowned upon in genre fiction. In literary fiction, it is done a little more often, but it was much more common in older literary fiction. And so as I was reading this, I was like, wow, this is this is interesting how he's keeping my interest, even though it's all narration. He didn't lose me at any point. And usually when something is all narration, they're going to lose me. And it had an old fashioned feel to the storytelling structure um, because of that. How did you feel about the fact that it was told all narration? It definitely lost me in the beginning because I, I feel like the story started to get, the story started basically for me when he started talking about Jai, this poor guy, because before that, it's just all laying out the scenario and the scenery and everything, but I'm, I'm just waiting. Okay, so where's the actual story? It's just the description of this dystopian future. Which again yeah. makes sense if it's a novel. It makes sense if it's a novel because you you have the space to do that. You know what I'm getting from this episode already, um, eight minutes in, is that Rami has some very strong feelings about the story. <laughs> no, it, it has nothing. Maybe I, for all I know, I hope it. You know, the the the, the book is a bestseller, or whatever. But as far as a short story, I don't think this this should. We should even be discussing it, but okay. I, 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 okay, I, but we're discussing it. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> so, Gerald. I, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I love Rami's just straight down the line, you know, bang, it's not <laughs> it's not a short story. And and I agree with you. I don't think I've ever seen him like this wound up, yeah, like right at the beginning of an episode. He's like, no, no one else is going to say anything because we shouldn't be discussing this because this isn't a short story. Oh, lovely. Um and and you know he's he is right. It's it doesn't you know it's got a beginning. It's got lots of middle and it has no end. So, um, so it, yeah, it's not a short story, but it's it's an interesting piece of writing nonetheless. Um, and and what what irritated me, and I think it's it, again it's it's a, it's to do with it being a novel, is that second sent second sentence in, he he uses a word that doesn't mean anything. It, it's it's a it's a sci-fi word. It's a made-up word, and I hate that. I hate. I like to get into a story. I like to read the story, understand the story, get into the characters, and bang. There's this word that Charles. That it's Charles. Yeah. That's yeah. a real word, though. What? That's a real word. That's a current word that people use nowadays. Really? Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a type. Dictionaries aren't your friend. Yeah, it's a it's a type of tenement <laughs> that's used in urban areas in India. It's a very specific type. I didn't understand it. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> no, me too. Uh, my thing. Thank you, Annie. <laughs> Did you see my little black girl? Like, yeah, I was like, excuse me. <laughs> she well, like, that is a word. But, <laughs> but but to Gerald's point, there is a lot of sci-fi terms he throws in without explaining. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Somebody explains, which which is nice. Just, just in a little aside, so that, that's that's okay. But sometimes it's your word, and you think, and it stops the the reading of it. So I I, I don't like that. But but so yeah. I, so so Ram, Rami's exactly right. It's it's not a short story, and that's and that's one of the things about choosing things that we haven't read before. But it's it's interesting, and it's it's you know he's he's a good writer. I love the writing. Um, I loved 
what he created. I love the characters, um, and and you know the we'll get onto the other stuff later. So, so yeah, it was it was it was good. It was good. Any is, uh, yeah. So I really liked it, and I I, I definitely see what Rami is saying because I will say even though I enjoyed the entire thing, including all the exposition in the beginning. Um, I did enjoy the Jai section the most because it's moving. There's plot happening. There's a thread for me to follow. So I think Rami is definitely onto something there. Uh, but I still enjoyed the the previous. Technically, it's broken into two sections, but for me, conceptually, it has three because it has the whole minor thing where you're not following a character and then it switches to Jai. And even though it only says one, two, it could conceivably one, two, three as soon as Jai comes in. So the minor section and the Seth section... Uh, I still enjoyed reading it because there was a lot to chew on. There was a lot to think about. There were all these little Easter eggs in there <laughs> that you could sort of like dig up. And if like new things coming into the story, certain things you're like, oh, that's really smart. Like there's this like ribbing he does with um, special economic zones uh, where then the workers there are getting paid piecemeal. And it harkens back to special economic zones now in the textile industry in India. So if you know about that, you're like very clever. Like there's all these little yeah. things you to chew on but it's true there's no plot there okay i'm gonna go against both of you guys well all three of you guys and say this is a short story and here's why because my deaf i know i know gerald i know gerald but i do think you can take a novel and create an excerpt that does defined as a short story and here's why i'm going to define this as a short story okay um <clears throat> i'm defining it as a short story because there is a beginning there is a middle and there is an end and change happens both in the character and in the reader. So the character Jai evolves throughout the, throughout his portion of the story, but also throughout the entire portion of the writing, we as the reader experience a sensation of learning and exploring our own thoughts and ideas about what's happening. And one of the things that I really liked most about when Roz Morris came on to the show was how she defined short story as having some sort of change either in the reader or in the character it doesn't necessarily have to be both and i felt like that definitely applied in this story as far as the exposition at the beginning yeah it was a little bit great expectations 15 pages of describing grass i get that but at the same time it was the perfect contrast to part two with jai and it lent more gravity and more importance to jai's portion so if we had went in with Jai's portion, I don't think I would have been as emotionally invested in the torment and the just pure destruction of that area and Jai's choice. I wouldn't have necessarily understood Jai's choice as well as by seeing that in this environment, in this world, in this country, location, everything is just so diametrically opposed. In addition, I liked seeing the contrast of you know, people using these biomedical um, augmentations, but seeing how that is different for the rich compared to the poor. <clears throat> and so the rich are doing this in order to make themselves beautiful or to create more interesting and more distinct um, uh, genetic lines, but the poor are doing this really to survive, but it's a real, it's the same technology. It's just on a different scale. And I think that that also, um, made it a very important reading for me. And that's part of what made me think so much about the story. So for me, even though it's an excerpt of a novel, it does qualify as a short story. And I do think it was worthy of speaking about on this podcast and I'm going to defend it. Darn it. <laughs> I, I think I think it's I think it's okay to talk about this uh, on the podcast. I don't, I, but but I it just doesn't. I I think the first part was was essential to show the world that Jai was was living in. I I think that was that was important. But but really, if if the story is just about Jai, if that is is the core of the story, you know, he he's a worker. He's got these this strange sort of I don't know, thing going on where he's beautiful and all the drones are attracted to him and he decides to get a, a, a new bit for his body and, and it goes wrong and he, he dies. And that's, it does not feel like a story to me. It, it, it's, it's, I don't know. It, it just. Doesn't... And I think that's our difference because I actually don't think the story is about Jai. 
Yeah, I was going to say, this has slightly, I don't know if you guys have read uh, World War Z, where it jumps around from character to character, and it's like little vignettes. So I think Jai is one of them. And in that first section with the Seth, um, it it ends with Parvati. Well, yeah, like Parvati's been interested in the mind. So I bet she's going to have a vignette now. So it, I, I think to me, the structure is probably a little World War Z in that aspect. So that is the complete Jai story probably in the excerpt. And what Maya was saying about the comparison between how the rich and the poor use um, technology, I also liked the comparison in how they reference religion. I liked how the Seth kept using religion to sort of justify the way that he was living and 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 saying how it's well, this is the way that you're supposed to live according to the scriptures in his interpretation of it. Whereas the poor rarely thought about it, except just before they're probably going to die. That's the only time there's like twice where it comes up and it's only in the most dire of circumstances. Um, and this is where I thought the writing got really clever as well, because in the, the Seth section, there he kept referencing the Seth in ways that were very sort of like Hindu. So there's the part where, um, he talks about things flow through the Seth through the cosmic corporate person he has conjured out of his navel. So in Hinduism, Brahma comes out of a lotus flower that sprouts from Vishnu's navel. So I'm just like, this, that's what I meant by all these Easter eggs. Like if you know some of these stories, you're like, oh, so they're comparing him to Vishnu, who is sort of like the supreme god of all who creates all the universes. So I, I just, I thought that first section was dense. It was very dense. I'm yes. happy that you have that background, Anais, because I noticed these things, but knowing that I didn't know enough about it, I, I couldn't relate as much. For, for So for me, the beginning, it sounded, well, all right, there were two things. First, I, I started to wonder if this was translated because the language, for me, it sounded a bit choppy and it tried it it felt like he was trying to sound like an oracle or, or prophesizing or something, but it just didn't work uh, for me. And, and also because I don't have that background. I think that speaks to being able to appeal to a general audience who might not necessarily know all the ins and outs of uh, Indian religion and culture and so forth. I think that's interesting that um, you said that. And Anais has <clears throat> more of a background as far as understanding um, this part of the world. I don't necessarily have an in-depth understanding of this part of the world, and I did not find that a problem for me. I, had, unlike Gerald, um, you know, when words were brought up that I didn't know, I felt like the meaning was very much understood through the context of the story, and I appreciated the fact that we were just thrown in because a lot of times. A lot of science fiction, a lot of like this speculative experimental stuff, you are just thrown in, but it's almost always in Europe or in America. And it's cultures that we understand quite well because we're in the middle of it. And we're used to seeing, you know, in post-apocalyptic world, there's no brown people. And I appreciated the fact that this story was approached the same way that you would approach a post-apocalyptic story in America or the UK, but it's done in India and it has some really Indian elements and it had, um, there's an Indian feel to it. And I can't quite explain what I mean by that, but I've had Indian coworkers that I went to their homes and we had dinner and there was a feel to the culture. There's like a sense or like a scent. And I felt like this story had that in a way that I really appreciated. I appreciated it on a diversity level, but also on a level of just because it's diverse, they're not going to spend forever explaining everything to us. Um, just going to dive in the way you would any other culture. Uh, and that's something I liked a great deal. Yeah, and, and and going along with what Gerald said earlier about just throwing in sci-fi terms. So to me, as somebody who's read a lot of sci-fi, when that happens, I get excited. I'm like, I know this territory. Now I need to figure out. To me, it's like a puzzle. But I guess as a reader of sci-fi, I've been sort of like trained. Like as soon as I see this word, I'm like, ooh, I got to add this to my vocabulary for this book. <laughs> so I think it's also a little yeah. bit of like reader training from the genre. I think it's good that you said that because I don't read a lot of sci-fi, but I read a lot of sci-fi growing up. And I had that same feeling where I come up to a word I don't know. And it like turned on that sci-fi reader puzzle part of my brain. I was like, oh, okay. 
I know where I'm at. I'm here. <laughs> I, I, I just, <laughs> Training. I, I think that's I think that's valid for for a novel. I think I think you can get away with that in a novel. I think with a, a short story, you you don't want to disrupt the reader. You don't want to to cause them to to stop and and have to work out what something is. It's it's I don't know. It changes the whole feel of the story. It changes the rhythm of the story. And um... I'm going to challenge you on that, Gerald, because we read a short story a long time ago that you liked that did this exact same thing as far as throwing all kinds of terms and not really explaining them. The one with the weird pod insects and the pod insect had to mate with the human and they were paired do you remember that? What story was that, Annie East? It wasn't Ursula Le Guin. Who um, in the world was that? I can't remember. But it did the same thing where it introduced a lot of sci-fi elements but didn't explain them until like way later when you got it through context. Was it Black Box? And nobody had an... No, no, it wasn't Black Box. <clears throat> I'm trying to think. And and you saw the one of the insects get killed because it was giving birth oh oh blood child thank octavia you blood child yeah. octavia butler yeah. thank you mm -hmm. octavia butler did this exact same thing but mm -hmm. nobody complained about the fact that nobody explained all the terms then <laughs> I, I didn't read it that's why <laughs> oh it was pre rammy yeah. it, it was um, catchy years <laughs> but, but to gerald's point i think i appreciate what you said maya that um you're, you're, you're representing a different side, a culture that, that might not be traditionally represented this type of genre. But the effect is that it's adding, it's a double layer now. It's one layer superimposed on top of the other. And essentially you need, like maybe Anais is like the prototypical reader who, because who, who has the, the background in sci-fi and Indian culture to be able to fully appreciate it without having to stop. I didn't take the time to stop and look this stuff up, but if I really wanted to, I would have, and, and that would have disrupted the whole thing. But even, so either way, if you keep going, you're not going to get the references. And if you stop, it's gonna seem like it, it's out of sync. Well, for me, I think the story was written on two levels because I do have a history of a sci-fi as a sci-fi writer, but I don't have a history of Indian culture. I didn't go through and um, look up everything. And I felt like the story definitely stood for me. But at the same time, if you do go through and you do the research, like it is written so that there's a story and then there's underlying meaning that can enrich the story. So then after the fact, if you go through and you start to delve into some of these nuances, you'll find more. Um, but you're right that, you know, if you're a sci-fi reader and you don't know about Indian culture, there's going to be a whole level to this novel that that you're not going to get. There's going to be a whole level to the story you're not going to get. But if you're willing to do the work, that there is multiple levels of interest and meaning in the story. Yeah, you you, you can say that. But I th I think we've talked before about about uh, the analogy of um, an iceberg to to a short story. So above the water, there has to be a coherent, tangible, understandable story. And and under the water, there can be all this sort of stuff going on. And and for me, and, and I, I don't remember the previous story, but for me, the the words and and the fact that it, it's. <clears throat> I don't know. We're not going to agree on on whether it's a short story or not, but but it's it's there's the 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 above surface bit of the iceberg is, is fractured. It's 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 not coherent for me. Yeah, I th I think um, I mean this seems to be like a really stark divide. You're either going to think it's a short story or you're not. Mm -hmm. um, from what I can see, that's partially dependent on what you think the story is about. So if you think the story is about an individual, you're not gonna think it's a short story. Um, if you think it is about a society and about economic um, disparity, then it can qualify as a short story, but it would qualify as like an experimental short story. It is in no way traditional short story. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be a very stark divide that no one is gonna agree on. So let's talk a little bit about the language because you guys have mentioned that there was a lot of words in the story that were you weren't sure of. And some of those words you assumed weren't words, but really they were. And so 
what does that say about the language? For me, I felt like the language was beautiful. Um, it was lyric in places, but it used um, very interesting vocabulary. I, I love the interesting vocabulary. And that's something I like in my reading. I don't mind being tossed new words. I get excited when a story tosses new words at me. Um, but if you're not one to read next to a dictionary, you might not be so excited. So <laughs> what did you guys think about the language? So I, I really enjoyed it. Though it's funny. So as I'm reading it, I'm thinking he's really clever. I also enjoy the vocabulary. Um, the first section with the Seth, I was stopping frequently to look up a lot of Indian cultural terms. Any word that I didn't recognize, then I would go and I would look it up. So it slowed down my reading in the exposition part. But having done that homework in those first two parts about the Seth and then the minors, then when I read the Jai section, I didn't need the dictionary anymore. I felt well equipped to sort of run through it. Uh, which made that section much more enjoyable. But I will say there's something funny that I noticed about, this is my personal taste. It's really nothing with the way that the author wrote it because the author wrote it very well. But I noticed there was something about the language that even though I enjoyed the themes and I enjoyed what he had to say about society and I enjoyed his dystopia, um, I didn't enjoy the writing as much. And I think I'm one of those sci-fi readers that sort of needs to see the sci-fi with a little bit of humor, the way that I enjoy Stevenson mm -hmm. or that I enjoy Saunders. Like I need just a little bit of jokes to get me through some of the grimness of what I'm reading. Yeah, I, I can totally, I, I, I do notice that about you. You do like those authors. Um, the story does not have any humorous elements. You know, it's funny, it's sci-fi, but... It really is just dark literary, just darkness. Like there, it's a very stark story. <laughs> you know, it's not Saunders. It's it's not Ursula Le Guin. It, it's none of that. It is just this world is crap, and we're gonna explore it together. Have fun. <laughs> I like that. I, I like I like dark. I like dystopian. I like I like dreary. Uh, I'm quite I'm quite happy reading that. You're quite happy reading stark dreary. <laughs> but when Annie's was talking, you had a smug grin on your face while you were shaking your head emphatically. What was that about? Um, oh, oh yeah, looking things up, stopping to <laughs> stopping reading a story to look things up. <laughs> Rant number two. What? <laughs> See, I would totally do that for a novel because, okay, I'll take, like Anais said, I, I'm doing the investment so that I can go the next hundred or more pages understanding, but it's not for two paragraphs. Ah, but doing that for a novel is just such a P-I-T-A. Like, just, it just, it's such a pain because it's every yeah. couple pages for 300 pages. Okay. I don't mind looking up words if it's only like 15 no, no, pages. No, no, no. You don't, you're missing what I'm saying. I, I mean, like Anna, you said she looked it up in the beginning and that prepped her to get through the rest without having to look it up. It's not that she had to look it up every So the time. only reason to look up words is so that you can understand the rest of the story. Is that what you're telling me? No, because <laughs> for, if, if I had the time and I actually cared, I would have as well but I, we're, we're, i'm talking i'm representing the the joe the plumber here okay that's that's what i see hey, my the plumber. on the show as. <laughs> you know it's funny i was gonna say i'm the opposite extreme because there was points in the story where it was flowing for me towards the end in the jai section i did i did come across one word that i wanted to look up that i knew what it meant from the context clues but i'm so sort of like anal about it that i still had to look it up just to and confirm I used to be like that but yeah. for, for, for this type of thing like if i was reading it for a class okay but just you know for my own edification i'm not gonna like really inconvenience myself to do that as well. <laughs> Yeah, see, I don't have a problem with that. And like Annie's, I'll look up words I know just because I'm interested in the third, fourth, and fifth definitions that add nuance to the meaning of well, a piece. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, that isn't the average reader's experience. So given this is our second story in Granta. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first story was obviously not written for the average audience. <laughs> so perhaps this story is not for everybody. I'm thinking that Granta has a very particular 
style of story that they admit into their journal. They um, bring in, you know, experimental, they push boundaries, they are willing to publish stuff that isn't quote unquote normal, that makes the reader do some work. And um, I appreciate that. And so I'm thinking that stories probably from Granta are you're either going to love them and get into them and be and not necessarily love the story but love the experience of learning and reading the story and of exploring what the author is trying to do whereas other people are going to absolutely hate this journal i think that this is a very polarizing journal whereas carve anybody can read carve and enjoy it you can be you know a writer that delves into the minutia of stories and you're going to get a lot out of carve you can just be an everyday person doesn't know a lot about stories but just wants to read something fun and you're going to find something in carve you like i'm thinking granta is is a little more particular yeah and it's funny because you were saying you need to dig through what the author is trying to say and i sort of want to dig through because this author in just six thousand words just an excerpt of a novel touched on so many themes and points and just all these takeaways that I, I was overwhelmed in an exciting way, like in a way where I was just like, oh, I could read this a hundred times and get something new every time. It was so dense. And I compared it to Queenie, which we read last week, mm -hmm. where I was like, I still enjoyed Queenie, but now it, it, it feels like, it is kind of like going to be a little feels mean. lightweight. Lightweight. I that's a good word. That. Yes, <laughs> it, it, that sounds derogatory. It sounds almost as bad as not. competently written, but it it yeah. does feel lightweight. <laughs> yeah, like I still enjoyed it. I really liked Queenie, but then compared to this story, I'm like this story. It's like it's like you're like eating like a like a rack of ribs with all this barbecue sauce, and it's messy, and you just covered in it. But at the same time, it is not so dense that it turns you off like Sodom and Gomorrah. Like, you know, the, Sodom and Gomorrah was on a whole nother level and you guys had a really rough discussion of Sodom and Gomorrah, whereas this story, it has a lot of that same, like, have to know a lot in order to get the alternate means and the deeper nuances of the story, but it's paired with a top level that doesn't turn off the average, well, it doesn't turn me off and it didn't turn you off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Aside from the nuanced language, I did feel that some words that were used were unnecessarily complex because when, for, for the words that I knew were, were just big that I didn't understand, when I look it up, I'm like, well, why didn't he just use this word instead, you know, the definition? And at some instances, especially one, I'll read the sentence to you. It what seems like it, it, it's a contradiction. So it's, though the Seth is famously ascetic, he does everything with pomp and extravagance. The word ascetic means one who leads a simple life. So how does he, is he that when he does everything with, is the contradiction intended? I don't know, but things like that, it doesn't make sense. I think the contradiction was, um, on purpose. Anise, when you read that portion, oh, how did you envision the Seth? I think this is a great segue into character. So how did you see the Seth? So it's funny. I I thought it was very clever of the author. Again, he's so clever that he didn't just have the Seth from the beginning being ascetic and very religious with the temple. No, first he was playing at living in Tuscany in India. And I think, and he only became that way when there was criticism. Oh, it's not patriotic to pretend you're Italian. Not that he was pretending he was Italian, but, you know, having, having that aesthetic brought in. Uh, and I think that choice was really well done because if he had been ascetic and religious from the beginning, he'd be like, oh, that's his true nature. There was something sort of manipulative and opportunistic about the way that he transformed into that in reaction to criticism. So I saw him as somebody who... I mean, there's that line where he sees self-interest as being one with Dharma, with the goal, which um, which seemed to me very clever. Or the way that he's making Parvati perfect, and there's that line where it's like, new money is just fashioned after celebrities. Old money, we have our own traits, like a certain eyebrow or an ear. Um, so I, I saw him as the archetype of the C CEO stereotype that you see today. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you um, said that you saw him as the CEO um, stereotype today. Um, when when I read that line that he's aesthetic, but everything he does, he does with pomp and circumstance, I tend to mean that in his day-to-day -day life, 
he no longer like he's really old he's what 150 years old Mm -hmm. so originally he was all into like lots of showiness and having this huge mansion and owning all the airspace around it and yada 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 but as he's aged he's he's developed an interest in something that is more important to him i think is really common with older people and so for him, what he's chosen to focus on is propagating his his um, paternal line, propagating um, the family name. And so he isn't ascetic in the sense that he no longer, you know, goes out. He no longer does anything, but he's ascetic in the point in the idea that he has a single focus. And he he is religious, like the whole of his house eats meat, but he doesn't. And he holds these huge extravagant um celebrations for the benefit of society of the culture around him but he's kind of just going through the motions what he's really focused on is creating this perfect child and and making sure that you know his line moves forward and continues to improve through time um i can i definitely see him as the ceo stereotype but i also see him as you know, when when that line came through where he's talking about, you know, living well is part of the Dharma and, you know, being self-interested is part of the Dharma, that reminded me of, of um, certain Christian sects that believe that being successful is a sign of, of being Christian. And so if you're unsuccessful or if you're poor, you're just, you're not Christian enough and that through self that you know the whole atlas shrug thing that you know that is what being moral is is to be self-interested and and to rise above everyone else and so i saw this as the as the indian counterpoint to that idea which was extremely interesting to me yeah but isn't isn't it a bit strange that that he's the author says that you know and shows that he's He's very religious and all this sort of stuff. And yet through him, these people are kept in penury, are, are mm-hmm. you know, dying and left where they lie. And he has water flown in from the top of the Himalayas. And, and from our viewpoint, that is separate. But we have to recognize that there are religious people who believe that being successful is a sign of being morally superior. And so I'm taking that, you know, Christian ideal that is in that is around in some Christian um, sects, and I'm able to extrapolate that this Indian sect believes the same thing, that, you know, these poor people are poor because they're not good enough, because they're not blessed. They might come back in the next lifetime and be blessed then. Um, but you're successful because God has blessed you and therefore showing your success, having your water flown in, those are all signs of you being moral and being blessed by God. And so even though it doesn't make sense to me, I step outside myself and I look through the character's eyes and I can see how that can make sense to somebody else. And I think that's important to understand because there are people that believe this. And a lot of those people have lots of money and lots of power and it's a good idea to know how they view the world through their eyes so that we know what's going on see i i'm so cynical because i don't i don't think he's really that religious or even believes it in himself i think the language hints at it enough that he basically does consider him a god he's seeing everything as his peers are god men among other men um but i think this false humility is useful to him and in his worldview, it's it makes him feel better about himself that he can phrase um, his success at the expense of others through religious justification. So it's like he's only taking that justification. He's only taking part that conveniences him, but he's not going to do any of the hard work of actually being religious. And I think he knows that deep down inside. It's like a it's like a form of guilt management through false humility. And I thought that was portrayed very well. Hmm. So he's basically How about you, Jim? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um let's see being human. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think there are a lot of people around like that. You know, not necessarily the 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 mega rich and uh, but I think there are I think there are people who who 
call themselves Christians that don't have very Christian attitudes and people who don't call themselves Christians who do have very Christian attitudes. And, and I think that's, um, that's, that's what's being shown here, that, uh, that he's, he has the ability to do a lot more good for the people, uh, but he chooses not to. So what did you guys think of Pavarti? Um, I had a little, did anybody else get the sense that those drones over the head of Jai were really Pavarti looking at the hot boy in the slums? <laughs> did anybody else think that? No, I didn't make that connection. Just me? No, no, I didn't. I, because, yes, because Pavarti, like the father is concerned because mm. there's a whole bunch of um, electro electrical energy that's going into the mines and he's like why and they've traced it they've traced the the virus detectors traced it back to his daughter and he in that last line in his section he he says why would she be interested in the mines and it seems like a small thing but he's learned that small things aren't necessarily small or it's phrased differently but that's my paraphrasing because i'm not going to look it up unlike annie's mm -hmm. and so and then you come to jai who is there's drones always watching him. There's drones hovering over the top of him. And everybody notices this to the point where he's been beaten up over it. They're wondering what it is. And he's very beautiful in a way that the other people in this area aren't beautiful. And I kind of like wondered if Pavardi was watching Jai point. through the drones. Artist, yeah. And it was like, oh, is this good? Is this novel gonna be like a post-apocalyptic? Indian like Romeo and Juliet thing? <laughs> no, because Jai dies. <laughs> well, we don't know. We don't know. We assume he dies. We know someone true, comes true. and save him at the last minute. Thank you. Pavardi might save him. This is true. <laughs> Pavardi to the rescue. Yeah. <laughs> what what um, I think about Pavardi, there's not enough for me to know, and because it's a snippet, it's like a trailer for a movie. It is. And we know she's beautiful. We know she's very distinct in her looks. We know she's smart. Um, we know that she has been schooled in a very particular way, but she's also smart enough that she's all up in daddy's IT. So, um, yeah, I, I think I, I'm kind of curious. I actually want to read this novel. Yeah. Pavardi is also the, <laughs> yeah. of the Thank goddess you. of fertility and she just... Mm -hmm. just Put it out there. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So also going going into the Jai section, that end where he gets the virus, I love that the virus was both physical and actual like computer viruses. If you think of them, he's seeing like sell your organs, extend your life for by 10 years <laughs> for indentured yeah. servitude. Yeah. <laughs> that was so much awesome. The 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 idea that technology and biology are so closely fused that you get a virus by having surgery and the reaction of the virus is both you're physically ill and you're getting flashes of advertising <laughs> in your brain. <laughs> I remember the anesthetic when he takes the anesthetic and he's seeing like, like the dreamy sequence and it also has ads. Yeah, yes. It was awesome. <laughs> I, I, I love that bit when, when, when he was talking about this, this sort of substandard um, augmentation he was having that didn't quite work properly and, and, <laughs> Came with ads, so I, I, that was brilliant. And that was, that was <laughs> he keeps trying to upsell him. <laughs> there was some humor there. Yes, there was some humor there, but it wasn't told in a humorous way, so you only laugh about it after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and 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 the the comments on surveillance with the drone felt very contemporary. There were those. There was like three quick lines that captured everything. There was there are many more eyes than people in the world. Jai, like everyone else, carries on his shoulder an invisible they, which I think we're already starting to do in 2016, especially when you communicate online. And um, privacy is a quaint word, like chivalry or super ego. And that's like such great snark. I just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really was great commentary on our current world mm -hmm. um, in a way that I always appreciate in well done sci-fi. Mm -hmm. mm. So we've talked a little bit about Seth. I, I gave you my um, Annie East's mother's um, version <laughs> of Pavardi. Because <laughs> that's totally something mom would say. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'm wondering, what did you guys think about the characterization of Jai? 
Yeah, that was that was strong. It was. Um... Yeah, I, 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 I sort of kind of hope that that he's not going to die because it, there, there's a lot of work that have got that's gone into the creation of Jai and and uh, and I, I, you know, I love the, the the fact that he's he's so poor and he has to, you know, he he wants augmentation but he can't afford it and he goes to this sort of backstreet arm peddler or something and and and, and I, I I I like that. It's very cleverly done. I thought um, so. I. I I would want him not to die and and, and carry on and and, and like you, yes, I'd, I'd love to read this the, the full novel because I think it would be be a great read. Well, you can possibly do that in the book club when it comes out. You know what? We should put this on the list yeah. of books for the book club. Yeah. Yeah. Good call, Rami. Good call. Uh, Props uh, for that. Thank you. Um, oh, hey, look at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So when he goes to this um, shady underground uh, limb peddler, that whole part kind of confused me too because it was in the red light district and it just seemed like a big smorgasbord of bodies. And I was just very <laughs> thrown off at by like what's going on. He was comparing bodies to geese and and using all this sorts of <laughs> language that I'm not going to repeat, but... <laughs> that he's not going to repeat. You know what's funny? This this story, there was hardly anything in it that was explicit, but yet he's not going to repeat the language. <laughs> well, it's of this particular scene. Mm -hmm. I went when he's walking by and, and all the scene. little body, all the little like sticky and soft body parts are reaching for him and like, hey, give us your money kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, makes you kind of think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but then there was, um, they mentioned bodily fluids too, and I'm not sure where that came from. You're like, like which what? ones? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> or maybe you're still traumatized from reading Delira. No, no, no. <laughs> please don't remind me. <laughs> um, you know, that whole section was confusing, but I felt like the confusion was really good for that section. I felt like it lent tone to that section. I thought it was really interesting that, okay, so he's going to this part of, you know, the town. You can't really call it a town, village, shacks, whatever. And I'm picturing something from Star it the Wars. Red Light District. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so he, he has to get through the red light district in order to get to the arm peddler. And it makes sense that in this world where people can be augmented and where people are augmenting for work, people are augmenting for pleasure, for um, for their family, like to propagate certain traits, that people would figure out a way to augment for happy fun time because that's what we do. We create the internet, first thing we do. Let's do happy fun time. We create cameras, first thing we do. We're taking pictures of Lord knows what. And so, I, when, <laughs> whatever, it's a history of humanity. We're only worried about a few things, food, shelter, and propagation. <laughs> and so I'm picturing you know, him walking through these, these alleyways with these buildings and there's all these augmented parts that are attached to buildings. And it was just a very visual, very um, icky, gross kind of thing. But it also felt kind of realistic, like something humans would do. <laughs> and so um, I, I like the confusion in that section. Did the confusion bother you at all, Annie's? No. And I think because for me, it just painted a picture of like the scene from Total Recall where like, there's the sex worker who walks out with like three boobs. So it, it, there was different parts of the story that made me think of other sci-fi, but not, I don't want to suggest that this is derivative of that in a way that builds on it. So that scene was total recall. The thing with the water tankers flying in was like Mad Max. And then mm -hmm. overall, the entire piece made me think, I thought this is like a really, really good episode of Black Mirror. I don't know if you guys mm. are familiar with it. Yeah. Um, oh, you should watch Black Mirror, Rami. Um, no. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, thanks for looking up for me. <laughs> it's so good. Um, so I, I think I think because of that, like having been like marinated as a consumer in sci-fi, it just painted these sort of like shorthand things from like oh, like Total Recall. I can just substitute that in quickly. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really have that experience, but that's just because it's been a long time since I've read any significant amount of sci-fi. And so a lot of the more modern sci-fi elements, I'm just not aware of. Um, I felt like 
what I liked about it was the sci-fi elements seemed like a natural extension of the things that we're currently doing in the world. And that's what I like most about sci-fi when it is a natural extension rather than just being something cool that somebody made up. And every single sci-fi element in this story, I can see the thread of how it, how we got there and it made it really realistic for me. So I didn't feel like I was reading something that wasn't possible. And that gave me that dread, that sense of dread and that sense of gravity with the story. Cause I was like, wow, we really could end up there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's when I appreciate sci-fi the most. That's the reason why when I read the Handmaid's Tale, I loved it so much. That's the reason why when I was young and I read Wraith Through, I loved it so much. Um, you know, when a sci-fi story can make it feel real, um, yeah. that's when I dive in and I go ahead and, and I enjoy it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's near future sci-fi and, and that's what I like too. And, and, and I, think, I think you have to have a connection to your present and, and to your current living conditions and current understanding of the world. So, so it's not a stretch, not too far of a stretch to, to, to get into the new world. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, I, I like that. I don't like sort of, you know, things, things that are like 300 years hence and there's, it's it's a totally alien world because because you, you because if three hundred years isn't totally alien if you look at the history of humanity going back three hundred years before us it was it's not like an alien universe like we, our clothing isn't that different <laughs> our makeup isn't that different um, our family structures isn't that different things are different but we tend to change incrementally. Mm. And this last hundred years, we've changed the most. But if you were to drop me in 1850, I would still recognize a large portion of the world as being our world. So I think sometimes sci-fi authors, they push too hard mm. or they think, oh, 200 years, everything's going to be different. Well, that's not the way humans work. <laughs> Some things are different. But we're still humans. We still only care about food, shelter, and propagation. So we're still essentially the same beast roaming the earth. And we have certain developmental traits. We have certain psychologies. And that affects how we use technology. So, you know, I, I love it when stories do that, when stories get that right. And I feel like they got this right. Well, this type of forecasting, though, when, when everything is completely different, I wouldn't say that it's too far-fetched because... We have, you know, looking at the trajectory of history, we have reached sort of a, a tipping point or something or, or a launching point where things are moving incredibly faster because of the advents of certain technological things, primarily the Ooh. internet. Oh, where they say, oh that's okay. He, he, was, he was making a really great point, but I actually agree with him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in this story, the reason why I say that it was done right, even though it was really different, is because the family structures were similar. The augmentations were used for things that people nowadays would want to fix. The way the poor were treated is similar to how we treat the poor in countries that have lots of resources that we need. And so I felt like even though it was really different, it wasn't. a lot of our human elements remained the same, and that's what made it believable for me. Yeah. Good to see you again, Rami. Go I ahead and make your I didn't even realize that I had disconnected. I, was, I kept talking. What did, what did you last <laughs> hear me say? <laughs> just, just start your whole point over because we're not okay. going to splice me then. So, so that, yeah, that's true. So, um, yes. So the fact that some authors, sci-fi authors, have these totally different worlds in their in their future depictions, I don't think it's too far fetched because. I think we've reached a, a sort of turning point in history because of the advent of certain technological advances, primarily the internet, where you um, look at, so I think up to before the internet, all of the information in human history could be, um, could be captured within 10, uh, what was the, petabytes, something like that. I don't know how many zeros are behind that. But now that type of information is that amount of information is released or produced every hour. <laughs> wow. True. But what what I'm saying is even though things are so different and things are moving so quickly, our basic humanity remains the same. So, <clears throat> yes, there's all this information on the Internet, but 
we still use the internet for the same things that in the past we used other new technologies for. So the first thing that we use the internet for is propagation, dating websites, That's happy fun first. time websites. Wait, wait, let me ask you this. <laughs> Oh, the, the amount the of servers are going to stay the same, right? Look, 300 years. I don't think so. But, I don't think so. But I think things move incrementally. Mm, three, look, as far as humanity ago, psychology. 300 changing. years ago, do you think the founding fathers, how do you think they would react with, to the rise of someone like Donald Trump? Do you think that they would have predicted their... We are not Trumpifying this be. podcast. He is <laughs> no, 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 oh, no, no, yeah. no, no. That's not Certain happening. Things. That said, that said, there were laws passed because of things happening that were very similar to what's happening right now. Yeah. So when you had the great robber barons and and the train moguls that went into political office, and you know, like this is not new, is what I'm saying. Humans aren't new. We create new technologies, but we still stay human. We still fight with each other. We still use stuff um, for nefarious, non-moral, in Rami's view, reasons. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to keep this episode clean. <laughs> I think I talked you know, about boobs. We, we still, yeah. some people <laughs> still abuse their children. Some people love their children. Um, pe people still cheat on each other. Like at our core, we're still human. And so what I appreciate is when we have really interesting, like new things happening, but the humans are reacting to it in a very human way. And that makes it more relatable. I mean, to me. I think this story makes the best case for your point. So this story talks a lot about caste systems, which is ancient. Caste systems are ancient. There's the tikal, which is the symbol they put on the forehead that signifies the caste. And then once you get into the minor section, into the jai section, you can see the way that people, just one caste above the next, prey on each other. Like the limmonger is only just above jai, and he's already preying on jai. Or the women who come from the city in their clean pods, breathe in the clean air, that distance, that uh, the, the way that as the casts get further and further apart, there's less and less contact, less and less humanity. You, they're literally in a pod. Or the flyer, the the pilot come in on the tankers who like are terrified of getting stuck there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's it's a very old and even in places that don't have caste systems, we really do exactly. You know, when you look at the U.S. and what was happening when the Native American tribes were kicking out the black members of of their tribes because they didn't want the black members in their tribes anymore, even though there are lots of black people that have Native American in them in certain areas. And um, you look at, you know, whenever one group gets a little bit of money or they get a little bit of access to something that another group doesn't have, there's this automatic, oh, we're better than them. And then there's a separation that happens. And it is, it does seem very human. And that's why I am a horrible person when someone says, oh, yeah, eventually we'll all live in peace. No, we won't, because that's essentially a human thing from the time of cavemen when we could say, ooh, 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 me belong to this tribe, you stranger, we fight. You know, the minute we could do that, <laughs> wow. Gerald laughing at wow. me. That's so <laughs> you didn't like my can voice <laughs> would you do it better no. <laughs> it was pronunciation that was off your kidding, grammar was impeccable I, I, I was just caught off guard i wasn't expecting <laughs> well i'm glad i could entertain you today <laughs> this is what happens when we record and it's not seven o'clock in the morning my time so, so, <laughs> something I, I thought of too is that so in uh, this idea of how he conceptualizes the future portrays it. So you have Seth, which is the most one of the most powerful and wealthy people out there, and he has uh, the the pleasure of just very simple joys in life. Like this is the sign of his uh, wealth: is that he can enjoy fresh air, he can enjoy green grass, things that are available to all of us now. But in this future, you, you're, you're surrounded by all the synthetic products that you just being able to do the very basic natural things is only available to the wealthy. True. And you say it's available to all of us now. I actually don't think that's the case. Um, there are huge pores of the world where getting clean water is difficult, including Flint, Michigan. Let's <laughs> 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 just... Yeah, okay. Um, and, you know, we've now got a situation where there are at least two companies selling cans of fresh air in China. 
And so, you know, um, it, again, it's an extrapolation of what's currently happening. Mm. Um, Gerald mentions that we're coming up on an hour, and that to me says that this story was perfect for this podcast. I loved it. There, I bam. Loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else that we wanted to talk about before we go ahead and rate the story? We need to reread this and talk about it again. We'd have a completely different conversation. That's how dense oh, totally. it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it really is that dead. I totally agree. And I do think that the novel, um, the full novel needs to be on the podcast. The book, on, on the yeah. book club. And I feel like this is the first story that I have read on the show so far that I feel like needs to be adapted into a movie um, for me mm. to fully... I don't know how the rest of the novels turn going to turn out, but if it's like along the same lines, and I think it might make for a good... Uh, screenplayers, adapted screenplay. I think the author would probably be very happy to hear you say <laughs> yep. that. <laughs> Every author's dream, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, who wants to rate first? I'll go first. Um, yeah, I, I, I came... My, mine's gone down a little bit. Um, I came... What? Yeah, I... I <sighs> I roll. How do I Wait. take away props? <laughs> Look at my side eye. <laughs> I'm feeling ganged up upon. Um, yeah, I, st I started at five and a half because of the um, uh, oh. because of the, the 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 words, and I've taken the half off because it's not a story, so it's five for me. But you started off pretty high, so I started because I, I enjoyed it. I I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed the world. I enjoyed the writing. I enjoyed. No, so so there's not much to dislike. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who wants to go next? I can go next. Uh, I came in with a five and a half, and I'm staying at a five and a half, even though I totally get Rami's point about how, like, two-thirds of the story is not much happening, and that might be a problem for some people. I am not those people. So for me, it's still a five and a half. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go with a five and a half as well. I found it extremely enjoyable. I found the nuances interesting. This is definitely a story I could read over and over again. Um, I toyed with giving it a six, but um, I think uh, reading it, while I enjoyed it a great deal, the sky didn't open and the angels didn't sing yet. So maybe upon multiple readings, I would discover that it's a six. But right now, as it stands, definite, very strong five and a half. I will give this extract from a forthcoming novel. <laughs> Just a three and a half. Just, just stick it in there. Yeah. Tell us how you really feel. Three and a half, Rammy. Rammy. Yeah. You're fired. <laughs> Rammy. <laughs> now you're getting the side eye. <laughs> well, the thing is, I see you. You're like a, a, a diagonal from me, so. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, it's a kitty corner eye. <laughs> Okay, well, we are an hour in, so now I don't. Now I'm gonna go with a very short, very easy quiz because it's not really a quiz. Oh. I think this is a great time for our listeners to learn a little bit more about us. Okay. So I'm going to ask each of you to tell me you if you could be augmented, <laughs> what would you want and why? Let's start with Gerald, Ooh. and then I'll choose the winner. Well, with nothing, because I'm... Based on my non-biased biased opinion. I think because I'm obviously perfect. Um, but <laughs> oh, well, first we need... Uh, before we before we get started, we didn't do... What are you guys sure. submitting? Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, I'm, I'm submitting a Chinese story, uh, Snow by... And I apologize for the pronunciation. Zhu Xiaobin. Okay. Rami? Sticking with mine, A Handful of Dates by Tayyip Salah. I'm sticking with mine too, Ghost Birds by Nicolas Pizzolato. Okay, so Gerald, what would you want augmented and why? What would I want augmented and why? I... I'd like to take things off. <laughs> 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 wow, brain out of ditch. Um, <laughs> um, that's a, that's a strange question. Um, I don't I don't know. A brain, because because I'm I'm not I'm not clear. I'd like to be cleverer. I'd like to remember more. I'd like to be better at doing 
mental capacity things. So, yeah, a little, you want little to be sort smarter. of little computer on, stuck on the side would, would be fine. How about you, Remy? Well, I don't know if this is not like following the rules, but I, I really wouldn't want to augment anything. And, and not because of what Gerald said, like, I think I'm perfect already. Because you're scared of turning into Jai. <laughs> And having advertisements in my dreams, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I, I think I am. All of us, not just me, we're, we're perfect our own way. Like this is nope. how we're supposed to be. <laughs> oh, <wow>. Okay. <laughs> Annie, I'm gonna accept that answer because it is so quintessentially it's Rammy. So the whole point that of this is. was for our listeners to learn more about ourselves yeah. and that was just so rammy yeah. okay annie's what would you want added um i gerald's kind of stole mine i would but mine's more specific it's not i don't just want more hard drive space for my brain i want specifically more ram like i'm tired of like walking into <laughs> yes. the kitchen and then forgetting why i walked in here or if i start a new task i forget the one that i was doing before and just like freeze so i want random access memory ram <laughs> Very good. Yes, yes, yes. Very you know, good. and I'm just gonna answer this just because yeah. for fun. I think I would want more RAM, yeah. but not just RAM. I would want um I would want faster processors. So I would want to be able to make those connections much faster. So not only just like have better short-term memory, but just be able to connect different ideas and thoughts much, much faster. So yeah, totally. Mm. Hard drive space, eh, eh. I'm, I'm fine externalizing that to a computer. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to select Anais as the winner mm -hmm. because her answer was just yeah. so much so full of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, so yes, what are we reading next week? We are reading Ghost Birds by Nicolas Pizzolato. He is the creator of True Detective. So fans of True Detective okay. might be into this. Hmm. But that sounds interesting. Yep. Before you go, visit our virus free haven at literaryroadhouse.com and share your thoughts on this not so future dystopia. While you're there, click the buttons and head on over to iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker and augment our reviews. It's how we become more powerful, as Vishnu intended. Can't get enough of the feelies you get from the show? Why not check out our other shows, the Literary Roadhouse Book Club and the Bradbury Challenge? And as always, share this podcast with your friends, humans and robots alike. Until next time. Read a good story. Read a good story. <laughs> yeah. And your outro, as usually, does not disappoint, darling. <laughs>